What's going on guys? Welcome back to the REI Marketing Weekly. Josh Culler here. And today I'm excited to have a good friend on the show here out of Baltimore, Maryland, the East Coast representing Josh Hines. Josh, what is going on my friend? How you doing? Josh, I'm doing great, buddy. How are you doing? Man, I'm doing good. I, I've been trying to get Josh on the show and we've been going back and forth. We're both like those people that like will like not respond to each other, but then we're like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> like we're all excited about it. And then you know, just get busy or whatever. I, I don't know about you. Sometimes I'll open a messenger. Um, like I'll, I'll be texting or using my phone and then somebody messaged me and it automatically opens. And then I'm like, oh, I can't respond to that right now. And then I never come back, but I think I did Absolutely. that to you twice. I but <laughs> I do the same thing. So no hard feelings whatsoever. And, you know, now even like rental listings and applications for positions all come into the same inbox. Right. You know, 20, you know, at one time and it's hard to respond. Sometimes. Dude, it's but, ridiculous. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just, I'm just happy to have you here. That's all I'm saying. Like we're good now. <laughs> so, um, glad to talk and, uh, have a good conversation with you. Absolutely. So guys, today we're going to be talking about two very interesting topics. And these are things that I've not really had anybody talk about on the show here. I have some incredible people, um, talk about very specific topics in marketing and, and your real estate investing marketing. Um, but this is going to be a lot more, um, it's going to be actionable, but it's going to be a lot more ideology and more like, um, psychology behind your actual marketing as opposed to like tangible, like here's how you send your direct mail out. Or, you know, we had Todd Swaggerty on a couple weeks ago and he was talking about specifically how to structure your, your, uh, yellow letters when you send them out or whatever. Um, that's not going to be this show. This is going to be something that you're definitely want to pay attention to and implement in your marketing, but it is going to be something to really think about and not just one specific area of marketing, but every single function that you have when you are doing marketing for your business. So um, the two things that we're going to talk about is number one is going to be prospecting versus qualifying your leads. This is something, so both of these topics were um, derived from Josh doing a couple of uh, Instagram videos that he posted on his Instagram feed. And I'm like, man, we, I need to get you on the show to talk about this because it was, were, they were very well thought out um, and very well, um, you know, just conceptualized and just the way you put it out there was great. Uh, so that's the first thing is prospecting versus qualifications. And then the second thing is um, basically, and this is something I talk about a lot, Josh, but I'm glad that you're on here. So I don't have to be the bad guy. Um, but basically like, you know, a lot of people or you know, you have, a, you have a lot of very big and primary markets and a lot of people go to the same resources to get the same lists, to get the same, you know, resources in general and the same connections and that kind of stuff. And if you're doing that and you have the same list, the same data, the same everything as everybody else in your market, how are you standing out? And that's what we're going to talk about here today as well. So those are two topics that I'm excited to chat with Josh here about. But before we get into it, Josh, I want you to go ahead and introduce yourself to the people that are listening and uh, just let us know who you are, what you do, how long you've been doing all that, where you're from, a little bit about the origins of Josh Hines and how he got into real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, man. Well, uh, my name is Josh. I am out of Baltimore, Central Maryland market. And like I told you, we're expanding into uh, more of the outskirts of DC as well. So a second market. Um, but I've been, I quit my W2 job just, uh, just two years ago now, actually, probably two years and like two days ago. Awesome. Um, and so last year was my first, 2019 was my first year full-time real estate investing, mostly wholesaling. Um, and this really is my second year, of course. But before that, we did uh, 18 to 20 something flips when we were part time uh, in our jobs. When I say we, it's my wife and I. We work as a team. She's my business partner. She's my life partner. She's my everything. Um, and we got two beautiful daughters at home, and she's actually pregnant with a third on the way, my first boy. So, congratulations, super. man. <laughs> Those guys are my big why, you know? Yeah. And not just um, real estate or money, but it's really about the freedom of entrepreneurship. And even deeper than that, it's really teaching them that they can become anything in life if they work hard at it. Yeah. And so, you know, real estate didn't come natural to me, but like everyone else, I saw people flipping houses on TV and stuff. Um, and my wife was a realtor and she kept telling me, let's jump in, let's jump in, let's jump in. And I just had excuse after excuse. And it was really all mental, just like anyone else. It was just mental barriers. And then we actually uh, bought our first place and flipped that. And that's what started us down this path. Um, and so we moved, we jumped in with fix and flips, uh, moved away from that in the last few years. Uh, it'll be making a comeback, but I just wanted to diversify my skill set. Um, and I found that there was a lot of value in becoming a deal finder. And so there's a lot of people out there that can flip a house. There's a lot of people out there that can make it more beautiful than I can. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just saw 
that there are very few people bringing actual deals. There's a lot of people who wholesale, but there's not a lot of people bringing actual good deals. And that's always my goal is to work with a select number of people but bring them deals where there's a lot of meat left on the bone. And so um, if you're a good deal finder, this is widely applicable into other verticals other than just real estate. So, I mean, that's a little bit about me to start. Let, you, let me know where you want to go with that. Yeah, absolutely. That was good. And thank you for doing that. Um, so I would love to talk even more about your story and maybe we'll do that in another show, but uh, we're going to talk about a couple topics here that I'm excited to have you kind of discuss. Again, these are things that I have not had anybody talk about on the show. Um, so let's talk about it. the first thing I want to do. I know that I told you before the show that I wanted to talk about, um, you know, how, if you're getting the same list and data and all that stuff, like how do you stand out? But I want to talk about the prospecting versus the qualifying first. I think that's a, that's a, that's a ingenious idea. Like you, you shot a video on it on Instagram, posted about it, kind of talked about it in a good 60 seconds. So we're not going to make it 60 seconds. We're going to make it a little bit more in depth, but let's talk about that. So what are the differences between prospects and qualified leads? I think that's the way you, you laid it out. Um, and why, why does that even matter? Why is it such a big deal to segment those two um, categories of sellers? Sure, absolutely. So let me tell you that I stumbled upon this kind of by mistake and by a lot of trial and tribulation. Um, much like a lot of other people, I started out on the phones myself, right? Picking up and, and going on the cold caller, um, just making lots and lots of calls. And I was going all the way from the process of pick, going through that cold call, finding the lead, setting appointments, going on appointments, signing deals and selling deals. That's a lot for one person to do. That's a wide yeah. variety of skill set. Uh, long story short, I spent a lot of time doing that myself and I didn't grow like I wanted to. And I found out it was because I was just not specializing. And so um, I find a lot of people that I've spoken with um, stick VAs on the phones, give them mojo or whatever dialer, and they say, oh, my VA is not really setting many appointments. What do you recommend? And so it's come to me that I just say, hey, I think your VA should be prospecting, calling up your list, finding out if that person is even in your buy box and finding out if they're even motivated to sell. So once they're finding out, they're pulling the leads from the prospects, um, those get set aside and then the next step is qualification. So really the first step is prospecting, finding out who on your list is motivated to sell, as plainly as that. Um, who on your list is motivated to sell today, tomorrow, or a month from now? So, and so let's, let's pause that for a second. I want to go into that. So talk about prospecting. I want you to talk about a little bit more about how you actually find out if somebody is motivated to sell. So go into that a little bit. That might be going trickling into the sales side of it. Um, but I do want to talk about that because that is important. Like, how do you actually know if somebody's a motivated seller or not? Because, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, if somebody's on your list of sellers or you know, whether it's your know, probate list or whether it's pre foreclosure list or whatever, that those people are motivated to sell. And that's not true. So how do you determine that? Sure. Well, it's, you know, really the right questions and in asking them with the right order of operations. Mm -hmm. And so there's different kinds of distress and there's different kinds of motivation that people might have. So it could be a financial distress or a financial motivator, why they want to get out of it. So like they're going to lose the house to foreclosure or they don't have enough money to pay for repairs. It could be a physical distress of the house or it could be a physical uh, distress of the person. And so you really want to find out why you think they might be motivated. Um, but so when we're on the phone with the person, we're asking uh, typical questions. One is, are you interested in possibly selling? Okay, you are. Um, okay, why are you thinking about selling now? They'll give you an answer and then um, timeline. So Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if we could get you, if we could line up on the dollar signs and the other important details, when would you even want to finalize a sale? And so the, those people will self-select and the people that say, well, you called me or, well, I'm not even really looking to sell, um, you know, they have little to no motivation versus the person I have, you know, a good five or six conversations a week now when I say, Mr. Seller, what's, you know, when are you trying to sell? Yesterday, two years ago, two months ago, two weeks ago. I get these answers and as soon as they say, as soon as possible or sometime in the past, you know they have a very high motivation. Absolutely. Those are kind of the questions we're asking up front just to determine if there might be some motivation there. Good. I like that. Okay, so then talk about qualifying them. So the cold caller basically is trying to have a conversation for a minute to three minutes, maybe five minutes max. They don't want to go into depth and ask a ton of details, but basically they want to go and ask a few questions to see if there's motivation. And then um, Steve Trang actually calls this clear future. I picked that up the other day. Okay, Mr. Seller, when's a good time for one of our other teammates to give you a call back? And you want to set that expectation with them 
That's very important. You just want to qualify to see if they're a lead and then get a clear future on the next action and when. Um, that next part, so after the prospecting's done, it's qualification. And that's one of my lead managers, uh, who in my business are still virtuals in the Philippines. Um, and for qualification, they're asking about the four pillars of motivation. And so that is their timeline, their reason for selling, um, their financial position, so equity they have or in how much they want. Um, and then what was the last thing? Financial, uh, physical, and about the house's condition. Mm -hmm. And so those are the four pillars of motivation for us. And I tell my guys, if I know the four pillars of motivation, if they've given us answers on all four of those questions, I can tell you the motivation of that person. Right. And so we can really start to dive into the most uh, motivated people and the ones with the best assets that we're trying to buy. Sure. Absolutely. So then once you've qualified them, you've asked those questions, you've gone through like, okay, you know, they're motivated. Now what's the next step that you take to, okay, so let, let's talk about the prospects first. So what do you do with those prospects, the people that aren't truly motivated and actually qualified to, you know, sell right now or two years ago? Um, so what do you do with those prospects? Do you just throw them back into the funnel and then, you know, retarget them with whatever marketing that you have going out or how does that work? So if they're in our bit, everyone has to define a lead. And that's something it took me a while to do as well. Yeah. Um, in your business, you must and everyone must be able to define what a lead is with specificity. And it must be the same across the board. So for us, a lead is anyone who says, yes, they're interested in getting cash offer or anyone who says, yes, I'm interested in selling. That's a lead. Yeah right? And so then leads get qualified. And that's what I just talked about there. Yeah. So if it's a lead, but they're not really motivated, um, we'll ask them, when are you thinking about selling? Or when ideally would you like to, to sell? And so if it comes out, well, it's in a year, we'll put a follow up date for a year and then start targeting again. Okay. So you're not hitting them between now and that year. It, so if someone says a year, we go in at six months. But okay. no, gotcha. no, we're not, we're not going to waste our breath on I like that. I, I like that because I've heard, you know, I've heard a couple of people talk about this. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, they may not be motivated to sell right now, but if you do the seven, the seven touch follow up system or whatever, like you might close that deal. But at the end of the day, there's not really a rhyme reason. There's no secret sauce. There's no like magical spell that you can put on the seller. They're going to sell when they're ready to sell, but it is your job. To, you know, understanding it is your job to actually stay in touch with them so that when they are ready to sell, they're going to think about a name. And if your name comes up, that's, you know, who they're going to sell to more than likely. But, you know, I, I, I like that thought because, you know, if they truly say that they're like, yeah, I can't do it right now. I'm looking in a year and then you're hitting them in six months. Now you're staying in on their radar, but you're not like bugging them when they're not ready right now, because then, it's an annoyance factor. Now you're getting rid of them because they're like turned off by you because you're just annoying them um, and spamming them and all this. But then you're, you're going to stay in touch with them like halfway through. And then I assume it's a lighter touch in some way, shape or form. And yep. then that keeps you on their radar. And then when they are ready to sell, cause it's not going to be a exact year that yep. they're ready to sell. I mean, it might be eight months. It might be 13, 14 months, um, yep. but you're on their radar. So I like that thought. I, that's a good idea. I like that a lot. And so I have like kind of a, a visualization thing that I like to do. I, I thought of this recently. Everyone has a timing bubble. And that timing bubble, like you said, you have to hit them at the right time. Um, imagine if you had a beach ball that was like surrounding you. And it could be a small beach ball or it could be a huge beach ball. It could be the size of the room or it could be a normal size beach ball. That beach ball is analogous to the size of your motivation. And so when you're walk, just imagine walking down the sidewalk you're bumping into other people, right? With mm -hmm. that beach ball around them. Well, you as a marketer, if you can walk and bump into that person, they have a big beach ball, they have a big timing window, right? So they might have big motivation and they wanna sell. Or if it's a small motivation, that beach ball might be really small and you have to bump into them at the exact right time, yeah. right? So everyone's got this timing bubble and you have to come across their path at the right time to make the deal work. If you're too early or you're too late, it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think of this timing bubble that people have analogous to that beach ball and you have to cross paths with them at the right time. So when you're talking with people on the phone, you want to talk actually less than they talk. You want to listen and asking the right questions is going to let you know what you can hypothesize, what their timing bubble is like, how big or how small, how big that beach ball is or how small. Sure. So that's what I'm trying to do. Tease out when, that. when I should be back in touch with them. I on love their that. Journey. Yeah, I love it. I think that's awesome. That's really good thought. Um, and 
you guys definitely need to try that if you're listening because that's a that's a really good strategy to actually work instead of just sending out direct mail every 30 days to every single person um, that's on your list, like strategize it a little bit more. You got to get a little bit more specific and direct with your marketing, which kind of segments into or segues into our next topic, uh, which we got like five to 10 more minutes and then we got to wind this down. Um, sure. Thank you for sharing everything that you did there in that previous uh, you know, conversation, but segmenting into that next conversation, which is if you're in the same market, okay, let's just take you for example, you're in Baltimore. Um, I personally know a lot of investors in Baltimore. I actually have four clients that are in Baltimore um, alone, right? And I'm actually going to visit one this this Friday. I was telling you about them. And so it's a little bit, it, it's not as saturated as like Phoenix or Dallas or whatever, but it's still, there's there's a good amount of competition. So when somebody goes to the same resources, the same, uses the same tools, same list, same data, all that stuff as everybody else in their market, you're obviously not going to stand out and it comes down to almost like, like bidding wars. It comes down to like who got there first or there's just a battle that you really don't want to get into. So in, in your, in your ways in the marketing that you're doing, how do you stand out from that? Like what it's, it is tough to do because if somebody, if everybody's doing it, then, you know, obviously there's a right answer to it. There, I mean, it, it's a good way to do it, but then it's also the fact of like, if everybody's doing it, then, you know, you're not going to stand out in some way. So what are you doing to combat that? Um, so I think there's a, like two, two different things here. So if you are, you either need to change your, your message, um, or you need to change your marketing. And so if you're changing your message, you could be hitting the same list as everyone else, but just to sure. put it very simply, if you're hitting an absentee list with equity, like everyone else, you need to change your postcard or you need to change your voicemail or you need mm -hmm. to change your text or your cold call or whatever it is whatever marketing messaging you're going out there with, you should not be ordering just the same pink doodle postcard as everyone else and sending it to the same list as everyone else. Right. So if you're using the same list or similar list because you don't know what else to get, you need to be unique in your message. Um, if you're going to use, if you want to change uh, your marketing lists, I think you have to go find some lists or find some methods or channels that other people are not currently doing. And so kind of how I applied this in my business is very early on, I found that direct mail um, was not something that I could use early in my career because it cost so much, A, and everyone else was doing it. Right. So I'm fishing in the same ponds as everyone else. Are we really going to be able to grow and scale doing the same marketing and the same message as everyone else? In my opinion, no. And so that's when I started hitting uh, the dialer more. This was about four years ago. I picked up Mojo and just started dialing myself because I knew everyone else was afraid to. Right. For some reason, my wife took a, a class called Bold with Keller Williams, and there was a stat, and uh, she came back and told me, and she was just like, long story short, she was like, you're one of like one in a thousand people who don't mind being on the phone. More people <laughs> would rather die than cold call, right? I'm but, one of those people, Josh. <laughs> so just by virtue of me not giving an F and picking up the phone and having a friendly conversation like we are now, not robotic, yeah. not scripted, going through a script. But um, being one of the people who wasn't afraid to do it and actually doing it, there I'm cha changing my marketing, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter then, the, li the, the list matters, but it doesn't matter as much if I'm using the same list. I'm going to hit other people who don't respond to that mail. Uh -huh. So in my business, I, I just started applying that principle by going and cold calling. Uh, another thing I started doing early on was dropping some voicemails on people when not a lot of people were doing it. Um, not many people at all. And so the response rate that I got was terrific. Pulled some really good deals out of that when other people weren't doing it. Hmm. Um, and so long story short, I think, you know, just like the real estate market, you have cycles where it goes up and down. You have to know where you're at in the cycle. Um, and I think when everyone else is mailing, you should slow down on mail. When everyone else is texting, you should slow down on texting and uh, fish in different ponds. So really that's all I'm doing. That's the principle of it. I'm going to either find different lists or doing a different channel or different marketing message. Or all of it. <laughs> so, you know, change your message and do something a little bit different and unique. You can combine those two things and you're, you, you'll stand out. And I, so I like, I like the direction that you went with that. That was, that was really helpful. And I think a lot of people need to take that into consideration because I 100% agree. Like if some, if everybody's doing it and here's the adage, right. And I'm in the marketing industry, right? I mean, I do specifically content marketing, but it's in the marketing umbrella and I have my own little silo here. Um, but the old adage is, is that marketers ruin everything. 
And that's, it's, it's so true. I mean, marketers, I, you see all the, the crap going around about text messaging now and ringless voicemail and how they're putting all kinds of restrictions on that. Um, and that's the only reason they're doing that is because of marketers. <laughs> so um, it's, it's good to be, it's good to go in different directions with your marketing for, you know, legality reasons, but also like standing out and actually getting deals that nobody else is getting um, and changing your marketing. Now, I will tell you guys this, do not get shiny object syndrome and not, do not go after something that's not actually going to get results. Um, and, and that's, that's what I see a lot of people doing. You know, I have, I have uh, content clients that we push out content onto their social media platforms and all that. And I don't know how many times I've had people ask me about TikTok, and I'm like, listen, if, no, if, unless your, unless your market is a 16 year old teenage girl that likes, um, you know, Migos, then no, that's not like, you're not going to go after them, right? You're not going to go on TikTok. So it has to be in alignment with what you're actually doing. So if you are going to do marketing, do a little bit of upfront homework and research and figure out like, is this actually like where my target demographic is going to be? Like, is, it, is this going to affect them? That's basically what you need to do. And if the answer is no, then you just don't do it. You don't want to waste time and money on that. But at the same time, you do maybe need to do some AB testing and some marketing uh, t t testing with your marketing. But just what I challenge you guys with is just don't go in directions that your audience is not in. The important yeah. thing is to move away from the direction what all the other marketers are doing, but still going down to the same destination of where your audience is. Um, so while, while you're there, I think that's very much like top of the funnel. So you need to know absolutely. Your property avatar and you need to know, your seller avatar, right? When you're in our space. Um, but so I think a lot of very early on, I didn't spend enough time top of the funnel. And what I mean by that is list building, coming up with avatars yeah. and really pulling the right lists to drop into our marketing funnels. Right. So if you get shit in, you get shit out. Right. And so if you're pulling the same list as everyone else, you're only going to get deals that are on that list, obviously. And so if it's not very honed in for what you want or what you're good at, then you're probably not going to get very many deals out of it. And so now really we have separated marketing and sales a lot in our business now, just like we have qualification, prospecting and qualification. Yeah. Thinking about those two things in separate buckets has really helped us a lot to really zoom in on the right people and the right properties. Absolutely. I love that. And that ties in together with, you know, both of these conversations that we had here. So appreciate you doing that. So Josh, man, it was good conversations having here with you. Um, it is 1030. So we're going to have to wrap this up. I appreciate you sharing everything that you have today. Um, is there any final comments that you want to make? If not, we will wrap it up. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, what we do is simple, but not easy. I mean, there's only a number of marketing channels. You don't need to get shiny object syndrome and chase down or do 19 different marketing or lead gen tactics, right? Find a few that work for you and get really, really good at them because then you'll just get so many more deals in whatever that channel is than everyone else. You need to become really good at one or two things. Um, and I think for us, that's really when it started to change in the marketing aspect, when we like really zoomed in. I love that. And guys, that applies to every single thing that you're doing in marketing, not just direct mail, not just you know cold calling, texting, RVM, whatever. Um, so make sure you take those principles and apply that wherever you're doing in your marketing. So Josh, man, thank you so much for everything that you've shared today. I appreciate it. And I'm going to have you back again soon because I love everything that you're doing over there in the Baltimore region. So we'll have you back again soon. So thanks for being on. Um, if somebody wanted to get in contact with you, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, email, whatever you want to share with us, how would somebody be able, be able to do that if they wanted to connect with you? Sure. Follow me on Insta at Josh with impact spelled out Josh with impact. Um, and then on Facebook, I have an online lead gen mastermind called the lead gen underground. Go request to join there completely free. We do a live every week where we're dropping gold nuggets, conversations just like this. Very similar. I love it. And actually I'm a part of that group. So you guys, there's a lot of really good information there. I'll make sure to link both of those below in the description. So make sure you check that out. So Josh, again, thank you for being on the show, man. I'll have you back again soon. And um, everybody else, thank you for listening in today. Make sure you're checking out the rest of the content in the REI Marketing Weekly Newsletter. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure to go over to colormedia.com slash subscribe if you want to get the full newsletter because there's a lot of awesome content that's in the newsletter and there's no selling, no pitching, nothing. It's all 100% value, helping you as a real estate investor amp up your marketing efforts. So that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you for joining in, everybody. And we'll catch you on the next one. See you later.